going to take a look at Spring Batch 5.2, which has gone GA and is now included in Spring Boot 3.4, uh, which of course just got released. There are a ton of new features, and I can't hope to get through all of them. Uh, the release notes, as always, do a fantastic job of kind of covering the nitty gritty of all the things that have been added. And here are the highlights. Uh, new support for MongoDB as a job repository. So historically, traditionally, uh, through all of Spring Batch's history from 2005 or six onward, uh, Spring Batch has supported uh, JDBC as a mechanism to uh, store to, uh, to store the state of jobs. Spring Batch, of course, is a uh, a tool for orchestrating long-running uh, batch processing jobs. Batch processing is by its very nature long running and so uh, you want to be able to keep track of how far things have come or gone. Uh, you want to be able to restart them if they failed, if the service for whatever reason uh, stopped or whatever. You want to be able to know where you were. You don't want to have to reprocess all billion records if you've gotten to like you know 999 million, 999,999. You've got one more to go and then there's an exception, right? Wouldn't that be a shame to have to reprocess everything? So you can keep track of that and then restart where you've left off uh, and, and there are tools uh, to support that sort of uh, workflow, that processing of data, the movement of data from one stage uh, to another. So historically that work has been based on JDBC. Now we have support in MongoDB. Uh, we also have a resources job repository implementation. So basically if you want to store everything in memory, and this is good for, for example, a one-off thing where you're going to uh, spin up the job, have it do some work, and then, uh, and then have it spin down and you don't care about any enduring state, uh, you can use this. So we've gone from effectively before this release having but one job repository to now having three possible job repository implementations. Now this is not exactly the same, it's not quite fair to say that. We had a map based job repository in the past, that map based job repository stored everything in you know hash maps in memory. This resourceless job repository implementation is, uh, it doesn't even store things in memory, it doesn't store anything in memory, right? There's no, it doesn't keep anything, it's all no op, right? So if you wanna move, if you wanna perpetuate state from one step to another, and that requires storing stuff in the context, that's not gonna work, right? All the stuff that requires durable state, even in the same JVM, even in the same process, is no longer gonna work. So there, it is completely stateless. Uh, so it makes it a bit faster and more convenient. Uh, what else? We've got adapters for functional interfaces, so going beyond just uh, function, we have now supplier and uh, producer, uh, not supplier, uh, sub, not producer, supplier and uh, and consumer and so on. And of course we have uh, the ability to customize the job parameter converters that are used in the de default spring batch configuration. We have a composite item reader, so now you can read from more than one source, right? Historically, uh, we've got an, a composite item writer and a composite item processor to write out or to process with more than one, you know, delegating to more than one uh, underwriting or underpinning item writer or item processor. Now we have one for composite item reading. Uh, we have the ability to start dependent steps concurrently, which is nice. This one, this one's really, really good. Uh, the blocking queue item reader and the blocking queue item writer allow you to, as the output of one step, which is a stage of the batch process, uh, just send data in, into a queue and then have, the, have that be the input of the next step. So normally in a spring batch job, you have a job. A job has more, you know, zero to end steps. Each step has an input, a processor, and a writer. Right, uh, an input reader, processor, and writer. Normally, you write everything out, only so that you can then find that same data, and it's in such a place that you can then bring it back to life again in the next sta step uh, in the reader. Well, this is this can be quite annoying because you have to write things out to disk or serialize or whatever, just so that you can then read it all back into memory and continue processing in the next step. Now you can kind of foreclose upon that unnecessary uh, reading and writing. You can just send data as the output of the last step. Uh, uh, as, and make that the input of the next step, right? Very, very convenient. Um, we have support for data classes in Kotlin and uh, in records in Java in the JDBC cursor item reader builder and JDBC paging item reader builder. Uh, we have support for query hints if you're using JPA and you want to specify query hints in the query, uh, you can do that here. Uh, configuration options for recursive collection line aggregator. Add a job registry smart initialization singleton. I have no idea what that is. Let's see. This uh, is a, uh, an alternative to the job registry bean post processor, uh, which uh, using the job registry smart instantiation and initializing singleton instead of the bean post processor allows users to solve problems like uh, this one, um, where they configure their own application context and want a mechanism to automatically register job beans with the job registry. Cool, so I guess this just gives you a different life cycle. That's really nice if you want to post process or you know configure uh, the job registry, 
Okay, we have uh, the Postgres database type uh, and mapping it now to the product name called Enterprise DB. It makes sense. Enterprise DB is a vendor uh, that uh, that uh, has been working on Postgres for nigh on 20 years, so it makes sense that they would also have a mapping here. Um, revisit the mechanism of job reg uh, registration. Fine. There's uh, numerous bug fixes, documentation improvements, enhancements. You know, lots of cool stuff. Uh, uh, but I really wanted to talk about two of these features here today. First is the new uh, uh, the uh, composite item reader, and then the second is the blocking queue item reader and writer. So let's take a look at an example that I've got over here. This is a simple Spring Batch application. I, in it, I've defined a job. The job has, uh, you know, I'm creating a regular job using the DSL here, and you've got, you can see I've got a static final blocking queue of type customer. Customer, of course, refers to this Java type here, just customer ID, string name, language, and operating system. And uh, the job is just called job because I'm not great with names. Uh, and or maybe I'm really great with names actually if you think about it uh, but then we are we you know it's a demo so I want this to build I want you to be able to rerun this multiple times and uh, have the same results so I've uh, given it uh, a unique ID for each run therefore it's not gonna get you know uh, it's not gonna be a dupe of a previous run so therefore it'll run um, and we have two steps one step that goes to the next step okay now where are those steps defined well step one step two I've got two configuration classes one is called step one configuration. You can tell because it, you know, it's, there it is right there. And um, I'm going to read the data from CSV and from a database. So this is going to be two different places that have data that I want to turn into objects of type customer. The CSV file looks like this, right? Here's the, um, these are all different forms of the word bill across different languages. Uh, uh, did you know that? That's pretty cool. So we're going to have a flat file CSV uh, reader. So we're going to read this CSV file. It's going to be uh, delimited. Here are the column names. I'm going to give it a name so, to, so that it can be stored in the database. And here's the field set mapper, mapping from each field set to a Java customer object. This is very similar to the row mapper. And in fact, you can see that similarity down here when we do the same kind of thing with our JDBC connection. We have a data source, we have the query, and uh, we have the row, row set that we're converting into a customer one, re, uh, one read at a time, right? So very much the same kind of logic. Field set mapper dot read int, row set dot get int, you know, kind of same thing, right? And both of those provide customers. I want to I want to process all the customers, whether they come from here or from there. Well, guess what? That's that's a, an ideal fit for our new friend, the composite item reader. Um, and what this does is we're injecting the JDBC cursor item reader, and we're injecting the flat file item reader, and uh, we're just creating a list of them and passing them to the composite. So the composite will read from both uh, and then pass all of them, you know, se serially in a se sequence on to the next step or the next, uh, you know, part of the pipeline, which is typically either a processor or a writer. In this case, in this step, we can see we've got the repository, got the platform transaction manager. You're going to need all this uh, for all spring batch steps, not just this particular one. But uh, the, the step here has the reader, which is the composite, and then we're writing out to our new friend, the blocking queue item reader. The blocking queue item reader is just going to point to this static queue that we created earlier. Um, and uh, and uh, that queue will be then the input to uh, the item reader in the next step. So it's a, it's a blocking queue item reader pointing it to the Java Util blocking queue uh, that we have here, right? The Java Util uh, concurrent blocking queue implementation. It's a linked blocking queue that we have here. Now, let's go see step two. Step two uh, is uh, here, surely. Step two. Step two, you know, same basic thing. We got the repository and the transaction manager, all par for the course. Got the uh, blocking queue item reader bean that we need. And we've got the item writer, which is just going to be, we're just going to create a printing item writer that does nothing particularly useful. Um, and so basically, now we, we're going to demonstrate sending data as the output of the previous step as the input of this step over this queue. So this, you know, it's a, we're going to read 10 records at a time, passing in and reading in from the blocking queue item reader, and then passing that data, you know, presumably after some uh, transformations or processing, off to the writer. And then we're going to write out data here. Huh? Not bad. Not bad at all. So we've got these two things. I think this is really, really powerful, right? Like we've got now two different steps. They're communicating. We've skipped the need to persist the output of one step to another. Uh, and this also means things go faster. Uh, and so, you know, you, remember, it's going to keep track. S Spring Batch will keep track of how far you've gotten on each of these steps as well. So it's not like you've lost the durability of Spring, uh, Spring Batch here. It's, it's still on your side. 
I quite like this. I quite like this a lot. And what this does, as it was so astutely pointed out in the, uh, in the, in the release notes, is that this supports the idea of staged event-driven architecture. Now, staged event-driven architecture is the idea that you have different pipes, uh, different processing stages for data. It doesn't matter what data. It could be a, anything, you know? And you have different stages of processing. You might do something here, then send the data via a queue to something else downstream where you do some more work on the data and then send the data via a queue to another thing downstream. Now, typically, uh, this uh, when we talk about queues here, we're, we're talking about actual message queues, brokers, right? Messaging. This is a pattern that, typical, that people typically associate with uh, messaging systems. But um, in this case, we're just using an actual Java util queue. And the idea, the reason that staged event-driven architecture is so powerful is because if you've got a platform uh, like Spring Cloud Dataflow gives you, uh, you know, that, that Spring Cloud Dataflow, by the way, uh, it can orchestrate Spring Batch jobs, you know, as a task. Uh, and it can also do streaming, right? And um, the nice thing about something like Spring Cloud Dataflow is that it sits on top of things like Cloud Foundry or Kubernetes or you know your your whatever container orchestrator of your choice. And in this case, each stage might have different sort of scalability requirements. Maybe I need to have five instances in one stage, and I only need to have two in the next because the work it's doing is quicker, right? Um, and so you can actually have dynamic sort of scaling for each stage. Uh, you can do load balancing effectively because if you really want to handle more load, just add more instances of that, of that processor at that particular stage. So it helps you create, arch and also you've got back pressure because these queues act as a buffer. You can't overwhelm the downstream processor by sending too much traffic to it because it'll just get into the, to the queue and it'll back up eventually. You know, you want to make sure you drain the queue as fast as possible, but you also don't want the deluge of data to, down, to, to uh, overwhelm the downstream processor. So, so that's one of the benefits of having that queue. And again, we're typically talking about you know a message broker, something like Kafka, where you can have a large amount of data uh, transiting through it, uh, or RabbitMQ uh, and its distributed logs, or whatever. In this case, I've got a literal blocking queue, which also provides back pressure. Right? If you write too much, it'll stop accepting those writes. It'll block. So this is really, really powerful. So let's go ahead and you know I'll let you explore the details. But let's just run this example. It's going to spin up. I've got Docker Compose in the com class path. It started up the application. It says that the job ran with the run ID of two, of this type long, identifying as true, fine. So what did it do? There we go. We've got all these different customers. You can see some of them come from the CSV file. Some of them come from our SQL database. So let's check out this SQL database here as well. Click on that, click on this, test connection, hit OK, hit apply, refresh. Do I not have? Oh, maybe they, oh, they, it's using Docker Compose support, so I need to do a Docker Compose start only, so that way it doesn't destroy the container as soon as the program stops. Okay, refresh this. Okay, let's try this one more time. Secret. Oh, it, the the uh, container is not public. That's the other thing. You need to make sure you export the port, otherwise uh, it won't work. So let's try this yet again. Go to my Docker. Okay, I'm gonna stop this and I'll restart this. Okay, it ran. We can see the batch container is there and now if I refresh this I can see I've got a table here called customer and I've got these three names in there right so I've got those three records here and the rest of it is from the CSV data here so I've got one through six in there as well how convenient huh I'm able to get the data from the both both sources and uh, I'm able to process all of them in one stream and then send them on to the next step for further processing without having to write them and then read them again right avoiding unnecessary read and write uh, activity. All right, well, this has been a very quick look at Spring Batch uh, in the new latest and greatest and most awesome Spring Boot 3.4. Now, remember, uh, you know, always be checking, always be checking the support lifetime, right? Remember, we're on Spring Batch uh, 5.2, uh, and that's part of Spring Boot 3.4. This is supported, right? This is the supported version. The versions before that are no longer supported unless you have enterprise support. And if you're in the gray zone, then you're not supported at all, right? So this is good for open source support. This will expire uh, next uh, November, basically. So make sure you're uh, keeping aware of that. And also remember, next year we're, we're going to release Spring Boot 4, not just 3.x, but 4.0, uh, the next major generation of Spring Boot, and Spring Framework 7, the next major generation of Spring Framework. So make sure to grab those dependencies uh, and be aware of them and, and pay, you know, heed uh, uh, attention, uh, give attention to the uh, deprecation warnings in the current releases, okay? Time to prepare for the latest and greatest.